just by way of introduction, um, I work for DHL Express. I have a couple of responsibilities. One is I look after all our sexy international products. So when you're sending overseas, I'm the man that has to fix things and make things work from a product perspective. But I also um, enable our, um, our, our SME, um, it's not a project, it's our, our SME initiative. Um, so I talk to lots of people like you who I believe are new or thinking about shipping. So um, because I talk to an awful lot of people that are thinking about importing and exporting, um, we created this for you, which you're all sitting on, actually. But it's, <laughs> um, and my, I'm going to talk to you about some of the contents in here. Okay? Um, but what I thought I'd do is talk to you about what I believe are the five essentials. So if you want hassle-free, stress-free shipping, you've got to do, I think, five things. And that's what we're going to talk about. Just a bit of an introduction about DHL. Uh, we are huge. Okay? Um, these are the divisions in the UK. Worldwide, we've got 100,000 employees. We're owned by Deutsche Post. And um, we're the market leader in our type of business in most markets that we operate in. So what you see about DHL in the UK, you're likely to see if you're in another country. And we deliver to 220 countries and all sorts of things like that. Okay, I'll just start here because I think this might be prompting you guys to think about um, export, import. E-commerce is where it's at. Whether it's eBay, whether it's creating websites, whether you're an accidental um, importer, exporter because you've had a query from overseas, I don't know. But this is fundamentally shaping our business. And it means that DHL and all the other carriers have to think differently. Because the demands that are put on us as a carrier are different. Gives great opportunity for all of you guys, because literally you can start a website today and you could be potentially shipping orders tomorrow internationally. And we help you facilitate that. Um, one of the key things on this side is that there's an increasing number of third country movements prompted by um, e-commerce, which basically means people are conducting business in the UK. They're never, the, the products that they're purchasing, buying and selling don't even touch the UK. So it's a third party, it's a third country thing. And we as an organisation and other organisations help you do just that. Okay. Selecting the right carrier. Cost is always on the top of everybody's agenda. And I understand that completely, especially new startups. You want the most cost effective way of, uh, of shipping. Cost is invariably equated and linked to speed and the size of what you're sending. However, I would urge you to think about some of the other things that I've got on that second list. Brand image, ease of use, flexibility, the coverage. Does your carrier go where you want them to go for a start? And also to build a trust and relationship with your carrier. So if you went to Express, which is all the big names, they're called integrators, and they're called integrators because we have a single network. And all the benefits, really, are about flexibility and ease of use. This is what I would suggest you look out for when you're looking at integrators. There are item weight limits. Also, you'll get charged more by volume than you will by weight, and that can sometimes be a surprise. Um, and there are product type limitations that carriers won't carry. So we do do dangerous goods, but not very many. OK, then we've got air freight. Those are the main companies. Now, I've selected you know, the big brand names, but there are a multitude of smaller air freight companies, and they do a fine, fine job. And they tend to um, concentrate on either particular destinations or particular routes. So it is different from the integrators because it doesn't always stay in the same network. It goes on commercial uplift. It could be delivered at the other end by a subcontractor. And this is ideal if you want it fairly quickly, but not as quickly as Express. Because if you remember Express and the integrators, we will do it overnight or within a couple of days for sure. Um, and that's the difference that you pay for. Um, Air Freight has a lot of options. You can have consolidation, which is when your shipments are all collected together with everybody else's, and you get a better rate. It goes on a pallet or in a container. Or if you want it special treatment, they'll just send your shipment together un under its own master way bill, and that will be um, delivered separately, but it will cost a lot more. Those are the things to look out for, I believe, when you're thinking about air freight. It's all about kilos, 
you may have to pay brokerage charge, that's somebody to actually clear the shipment, well, in fact, export it out of the country and import it at destination. DHL as an integrator and UPS have their own customs. So it stays with DHL, gets to the destination, and it's a DHL employee that does that customs clearance, not a broker or not an agent. You also need to ask about additional fees and you need to ask about, is it guaranteed? And you'll, you need to ask your carrier that because guarantees mean different things to different people, I would say. Uh, sea freight, this is for the really big stuff. It's all about planned, um, planned low value volume goods. But what I'm trying to do is just paint a picture that there's a path actually. Often, um, people like you who are thinking about using um, exporting will come to a company like us. We're a big brand name, we do a great job. And we've got a good track record of growing businesses. So if you take Netta Porter, no Netta Porter? When we first started dealing with them, they had three people in the King's Road. They're now our, one of our largest customers, worldwide, in fact. So the brand is a strong brand. And I've heard people say, well, DHL won't be interested in me because I'm only shipping half a dozen shipments. Not the case. 80% of our account holders are people like you. And then, of course, there's postal, probably the cheap, probably the most cost-effective cost if that's what you need. Uh, but it's different. So what I'm trying to illustrate here is it's horses for courses, and it all depends on what you want. I'm not going to come here and say DHL are great. Well, I am actually. I'm going to say DHL are great. But there are other alternatives. And it's all about choosing the right mode. Because if you don't choose the right mode of export, you'll disappoint your customer. And you'll create a whole load of backroom costs that you never even knew existed. So how am I going to get the shipment back that they don't want? How am I going to credit him? He's not going to pay. All because we didn't deliver it. Or it wasn't delivered. Because you would have chosen, potentially, the wrong way of doing it. So it's really important that you think about your uh, brand proposition. When, you, when you're thinking about a carrier as well. Your receiver will know the brand, and the brand is similar throughout the world in terms of what it stands for. Inco terms, are you familiar with these guys? They're a complete nightmare, I have to tell you, but they're very important for you to think about because it, it enables you and it establishes responsibility between you, the shipper, and the receiver. And it's very clear about who pays for what who accepts the responsibility when. And there is a bit of a nightmare, to be honest. And you think, oh no, really? But important to get your head around. There's lots of information about it. Um, business link, uh, the, the brochure here that we've got, will tell you about it. And really what it's doing is saying that you, the shipper, you, the receiver, should come to an arrangement, a very clear arrangement, about who's paying for what. Because there's nothing worse that, you know, if you're sending, if you're sending, um, uh, DDP, deliver duty paid, that means the duty and taxes are going to come back here to the UK for you to pay. You need to understand that. Is it going to be DDU or in fact, what's it now called, uh, delivered at place? In essence, you're sending it and the receiver will pay the duty and VAT. And it's clear. You know, these are international recognised everywhere. I would, I always recommend, I have to say, UKTI and Business Link, apart from our two websites as well. And we reference those two organisations all the time because they're the source really. I think you ought to have an appreciation of customs. You don't have to know everything about them. But if you look at those responsibilities, it's not only about collecting duty. You know, it's counter-terrorism. There's a huge amount of stuff going on in customs. And, and you have to... I bring this up because you have to have an appreciation of customs throughout the world. And, and it's different. In the UK, there's a... Um, it's a really interesting topic. But I think... My only message would be, it differs around the world significantly. Don't judge it by what you see it in the UK or, or, or the rest of Europe, actually. Um, I think that's all I want to say about that. There's another little box to go there, I think. Uh, duty and taxes don't always apply. So there are de minimis values. Ever heard of that? De minimis values, um, every country has them, and it's the value at which duty and VAT are not charged. Okay, so in the UK it's 15 quid, anything under 15 quid doesn't get any duty and VAT. In Australia, now Australia is one of the, one of the fastest growing B2C lanes that we're operating and also Royal Mail have also announced that as well. And Australia have got a very high de minimis value, so it's a thousand, US, a thousand Australian dollars. So that's good, it's good for trade, it's great for their impact, you know, inward trade and it's good for us. And, it's, and Australia as a lane is growing like mad. No, I mean, it's that. It's also about their customs are good. It's also about the exchange rate's been quite good for them. 
We have a very close working relationship with customs. So in the UK, for example, we're the only carrier that inputs directly into Chief, which is the customs computer. No other carrier does it. They all have to go through third parties. And that's an indication of, A, what customs think about us here in the UK, how developed our processes are, and how often we're audited. Uh, but it's a, it's a great advantage for us. OK. I'm almost done. Product descriptions. You think, this is really dull. Why is he going to get into this detail? But the biggest reason for, for failure going through customs is that your descriptions are not good enough. If you come up with generic descriptions like gifts, samples, electronics, most customs will stop it. What does that mean? They don't know. So you have to be more descriptive. And it really counts. And it pays dividends, actually. And um, um, I'll introduce something as well that you'll all moan about. Or everyone go, oh, no, harmonised HS codes, harmonised system codes. Anybody heard of those? OK. Everyone says the same. But they are fantastic. 98% of world trade are covered by them. OK, they're a unique classification for each product. So whatever you're producing, you are likely to... Oh, there's 68,000, I think, in the UK, in, in, in the tariff books. Um, you will find a, a, a unique identification number. Now, that is used in most customs around the world to determine what duty and VAT is applicable. If you, so if they otherwise, they work off the description. So there's a description, you know, it's a top hat, so they just type in top hat, and you'll get charged the highest duty. But let's say it was top hat, I don't know, made of cotton, right, as opposed to felt, the duties will be different. Now, the only way that they can really identify that nuance is through the HS code. DHL has a tool that enables you to do that, to look, to look up the HS classification, um, HMRC, customs, go to the business link and they'll send you to the right place. And in fact, if you're having difficulty assessing or classifying your, uh, oh, it's this, cl uh, classifying your goods, then um, HMRC will do, I think, six for free for you, and then they charge you a, a, minute, a small amount to, to classify thereafter. But it's worth going, it's, it's a nightmare to do. Destination duty and taxes, really important. Uh, really important to you guys, because are you going to sell what you sell on the internet? Are you going to sell it inclusive of duty and VAT at destination, or are you going to sell it without the duty and VAT at destination? So there's the market access database. That's a really good tool, actually. It's um, run by the um, EU. Uh, DHL have a tool called Trade um, TAS, uh, Trade Assessment Services, and uh, that enables you to look up the destination duty and taxes at the other end. Very, it's very, very useful. And I have to say, you're kind of walking around in the dark if you don't really know what the duty... Because, of course, it could outprice you. You know, people look on the internet, oh, that's excellent, 15 quid, I'll have that. Gets to the other end, and you've got another 25 quid's worth of duty and VAT to go on it. So you, you need to know that. And, and it is accessible, actually. Um, and we call it landed cost. So the landed cost is, is basically the value of the goods, what, what the sale price, plus transport, plus insurance, plus duty and VAT, and any extra customs-type charges. So if you take our system, for example, it's updated every 24 hours. So, there's, it's, so it's, it's run in the States. It's a global tool, and they have links to all the customs um, uh, areas, and, and it's updated every, 12, every 24 hours. And this is what we do at DHL. We have um, associations with all those um, fine institutions on the right, um, and we create a lot of material to help new shippers.